to start with the greatest name of almighty allah most gracious and merciful whose bounty whose benevolence is everlasting whose blessings are uncountable whose being is eternal whose mercy is unlimited whose provisions are unending and whose love is a life whose worship is a faith assalamu alaikum and good morning to all of you present here on behalf of the indus hospital health and network and urology department korangi campus i would like to welcome honorable icon chair and co-chair worthy speakers and all beloved participants in the 6th biennial conference which obviously needs no introduction everyone here knows about its about its incidents types aggression of tumor and management but what i believe is that a uh, uh, bladder cancer is like an iceberg model the visible part of the iceberg which is what you know about the bladder cancer but it has something that is huge and perhaps not known to us is the part which lies under the surface so to put light on the hidden part but yet the most important yet the important content of the bladder cancer we have an amazing panel of speakers today so uh, i would like to uh, invite our first speaker which is uh, dr abdul hafiz he is a uh, uro oncologist in the indus hospital and head of urology section as well and he is going to talk on the management strategy in high grade muscle invasive high grade non muscle invasive bladder cancer hi uh, i am dr abdul hafiz and uh, i welcome you uh, in the icon 2022 uh, virtual meeting so today i am going to uh, discuss about uh, the patients who have the high grade non muscle invasive bladder cancers and how we manage these type of the patients i am working as a head of department in the uh, indus hospital in the department of urology so uh, at the end of my presentation the uh, the uh, the participant would be able to understand the how we do the basic management of the patients who have high grade non muscle invasive bladder cancer and uh, then the patients who have the failed treatment for the first line so how we deal with these patients and uh, i will discuss about the literature regarding the management of uh, the high grade non muscle invasive bladder cancer and at the last uh, uh, we will discuss about the what the eau uh, guidelines say about the management of the patients who have the high grade non muscle invasive bladder cancer so this is the the tnm classification we usually use uh, in our clinical practice so i would be much more emphasis on the the carcinoma in situ and the patient who have the t1 disease which are high risk disease so this is the the pictorial presentation the patients who have uh, the bladder tumor this is the whole the progression of the disease but i would be much more concerned about the patient who have the the disease of the lamina propria and uh, the cis <clears throat> so about the 75 to 85% of the patients who comes in our clinic who have the non muscle invasive bladder cancers and uh, by looking the cis which is a the tumor in situ which they usually always considered to be as a high risk patients so there are certain indications the patients who need the radical cystectomy like the patients who have the refractory to the bcg immunotherapy which is a basic management of the patients who have the high risk disease which is non muscle invasive disease or the patients who have the t1 disease but the recurrent t1 disease they also are the potential candidate for the radical cystectomy and we know that the patients who have the t2 more than t2 disease they are considered to be the patients for the radical cystectomy so when we talk about the management of the high grade non muscle invasive bladder cancer so these are the basic points which i have uh, mentioned over there we start with the the tur or the tumor resection which is most, most important part of the first part of the management of the patient who have the non muscle invasive bladder cancer then second we always the the classify the patients according to the risk assessment and then when we use the single installation of the chemotherapy then looking to the bcg or the chemotherapy for the patients who have the non muscle invasive bladder cancer we will discuss about the bcg and what are the effects of the bcg and looking the maintenance and the induction of the bcg looking the t1 high grade and the bcg and at the last i will discuss about the algorithm and the management of the cis so looking the the tur uh, this is the whenever we have the patient who have this bladder tumor the operative steps which are very important to achieve a successful tur so what are the factors which we look in the patients who have the tur so we are starting with the number of the tumors either single tumor or the multiple tumors we look the size of the tumor which is either the less than 3 cm or the more than 3 cm then looking for the single lesion or the multifocal disease then we look the character of the patient the character of the tumor and we look the the concern of cis either it's a recurrent cis or the primary cis and then we look the clinical stage by doing the biomanual palpation under anesthesia then after doing this tur we we looked at the patient either they have the complete tur 
either this incomplete TU app. Then at the last, we look the complication if there is complications. So this is the the uh, one of the large randomized control uh, trial uh, in which the 2200 patients they were uh, given the single installation of uh, the mitomycin, and they looked at that the immediate single installation. Uh, mitomycin after TUR reduce, reduces the risk, uh, recurrence risk in the patients who have the non-muscle invasive disease. So again, it's a strong uh, strong evidence. So whenever we uh, do the uh, TUR, there are the two surgical strategies. Either we go for the piecemeal resection into small fragments, with small, small, we take the chips from the tumor and either in block resection, either by using the monopolar, bipolar, or the lasers or holmium or thulium lasers. So this is the uh, the EURTC scoring model in the risk table, which we I discuss about the patient after doing the TUR. We they classify the patients by looking the certain factors. We give the scoring to the patients, and then we predict about the short and long term risk of the disease recurrence and progression in a patient who has the non muscle invasive disease. So this is very important, and that can give us idea about the what the the risk of the progression and the recurrence of the disease. So what we look into these, as I told you, we look the number of the tumors at the single or the multiple. Tumor diameter is very important. Prior recurrence or not, we categorize the patients at the low grade or intermediate or the high grade patients. Then we look the concurrent CIS, and again we grade the disease. This is the uh, the EURTC uh, the the uh, calculator which you can easily download from the by putting the Google EURTC dot BA public tools and the bladder calculator. You can you can put the the every uh, according to the, the tumor characteristic, you can calculate the, uh, the probability of recurrence and the uh, risk of progression of these tumors. Coming, coming to the CETO uh, scoring model, this is the scoring model is especially for those who patients who are treated with the BCG. And this is a Spanish oncological uh, group, which had, they have uh, the, developed this model. It's also in our uh, European urology guidelines in 2021. So this, this also predicts the risk of recurrence and progression of the disease who are treated with the BCG. So these are the certain parameters which they are put into these, um, giving the scoring. So by looking the gender, age of the patients, prior recurrence stress, number of tumors as well, which are the same like, like EOTC, look the T grade, T stage of the disease, associated CIS, and again the 1973 tumor grade. So these patients, they are basically classified into the low risk, intermediate high, and the very high risk. Before the 2021, in 2020 and 19, the very high risk was not in this uh, the table, but in the 2022, 21 guidelines that shows about the very high risk as well. So if you look at the patients who have the single lesion, less than three centimeter, it doesn't have any CIS, less than 70 year of age, they are considered to be the very lowest patients. Coming towards the high risk, I always about, I don't go for the intermediate, I go for the high risk because between the high and the low risk, whatever the patients who comes, we put in the intermediate risk group. So in the high risk patients, all the T1, which are high grade, without CIS, they consider to be the high risk disease. And the patients who have the stage, we look at like a TA disease, even though they are low grade, are T1 disease, but they have all three risk factors. You can see the, in the, the bottom line of the slides, what are these risk factors, like ages more than 70, multiple papillary tumors, and the tumor is more than three centimeters. They are considered to be the high risk disease patients. So there's another uh, the group, which is a very high risk group. So you can see the TA, which is a papillary, but they are high grade lesions and CIS with all three risk factors. They are considered to be very high risk patients. So this is the, the different group and their group is uh, usually they are very high risk because they are much more, uh, they have the tendency to, to progress the disease. So they are always considered to be very high risk disease like, like a T2 disease patients. So uh, I'm talking about the patients who have uh, the, uh, the tumor, which is located in a difficult positions, like a, like a diverticular tumors. Obviously uh, the diverticular tumors, they are not easy to manage because they don't have the, the detrusor muscle. So these are uh, always there are the chances for the perforation because they don't have the detrusor muscle. So for accurate staging is somewhat is very difficult. So whenever you think about, you have to do the resection then you have to widen the neck of the diverticulum because uh, you are not able to enter your uh, the resectoscope into the diverticulum. So sometimes we reject the bladder, uh, the diverticular neck, and we enter our resectoscope. So when you look about it, if it's in a TA disease or the T1 disease, papillary lesion is there, you can just do the fulgration of the disease, fulgration of the tumor. But if you look about it, it's an extensive tumor, large tumor is there, then you have to do the proper resection because you need the proper histopathology, 
to reach the diagnosis and then you can up, uh, you can opt for the best the best management for the patients sometimes we do the resection even until the perivascular fat because so sometimes these are very high grade diverticular tumors and you consider about the partial or the radical cystectomy coming to the anterior wall or the dome tumor is located at the dome obviously it's very difficult area you can re you can't reach with the resectoscope at the the 12 o'clock position you have to move your resectoscope toward the 12 o'clock position you put your hand at the suprabibic area to press it and you do the minimal filling of the bladder because when you do the minimal filling fl uh, bladder filling the dome will come down put your hand left hand over there and do the resection with the right hand so this is the the way you can do the the resection at the dome and the anterior wall of the tumor because it's sometimes tumor extend the bladder neck you have to do at the, the resection at the 12 o'clock position to reach your the basic uh, your, your the definitive histopathology so coming to the ureteral orifices obviously there is always risk of here to do the resection of the ureteric orifices but remember remember one thing don't use the fulgration to do the fulgration always use the pure cutting at the ureteric orifice sometimes you have to do the resection of the both uos or the or the uo whatever the tumor is located to reach your the the definitive diagnosis so these are the the treatment uh, which is uh, from uh, the european urology guidelines but i would be much more uh, concerned about the the high risk group so the so uh, the high risk group you can see the last two lines so the, the we offer about the bcg whenever you have uh, diagnosed that the patient have the t1 disease or the high risk disease or the cis the bcg is the the best management you you have to start with the induction you have to start the six cycles inductions and then uh, you do the cystoscopy and then if the cystoscopy is negative cytology is negative go for the maintenance regime so this is the basic and you can see there's a one to three years of maintenance regime or the radical cystectomy the strong uh, the evidence while coming towards the very high risk patients you can see they are they should be they can be considered for the radical cystectomy or if they are not you know, they are unfit or they refuse for the radical cystectomy we go for the intravesical full dose bcg which is one to three years so uh, again, there's a different, uh, the confusing terminology, they always ask about, they, my resident always ask about what is the refractory, what is the relapsing, what is intolerance. So, so this is a very important, the word refractory, refractory indicates, which is totally not responsive. You have started the patients starting with the induction BCG, if the patient who have the T1 high grade tumor present at the three months, you have started the induction, you have done the first cystoscopy, you find the same tumor, they are refractory disease. Patient have the TA disease, which is high grade disease, either present at three months or six months, even after the reinduction of the first course of the maintenance, you, you they can't consider to be their refractory disease. They will not respond with the, the BCG. If the patient who have the CIS without concomitant papillary tumor is present at three months and persists for the six months, either after induction of the reinduction of the first course of maintenance. So these patients, they're very difficult. They will not respond with the BCG. They are known as the refractory disease. Coming toward the relapsing, uh, the relapsing indicates that you have uh, treated the patient with the induction as well as the BCG complete course. Patient have given the response, but after the six months doing the cystoscopy, you find the same disease, then it was a relapsing disease. Then third one is the BCG unresponsive tumors. These are the unresponsive tumors. They are all BCG refractory tumors. Remember one thing, refractory, all refractory, they are unresponsive. Word means unresponse. And those who develop the T1 disease, high grade recurrence within six months of the adequate BCG exposure. So they are known as a uh, BCG unresponsive tumors. What are the treatment options for these patients? If we look at the BCG unresponsive tumors, the radical cystectomy is one of the option. Are the patients who are not willing for the radical cystectomy, refusing, you can opt for the, BC, the, the bladder preserving study like trimodal therapies, uh, or you can put the patient in enrollment in some clinical trials. Then coming toward the late BCG relapsing, where T1 or the high grade are after the six months or after the 12 months, then you can say the patients can opt for the radical cystectomy or you can in a relapsing disease you can use the repeat bcg course but not into refractive disease they usually do not respond and uh, the low grade recurrence after bcg for the primary risk repeat bcg because sometimes the patient who have the high risk disease t1 disease you have treated completely but in the follow-up you find there's a low grade disease so you can you can put the intravesical chemotherapy because it is a ta disease low grade disease you can put the chemotherapy like a mitomycin or you can repeat the BCG as well. So this is the, the bit of difference between these uh, type of the, the BCG failure patients. Again, there's uh, the, the one of the, uh, the uh, article that was published in 2017 uh, by the Professor Viges that the BCG unresponsive non-muscular bladder cancer, what the recommendation are. 
So looking for the intravesical immunotherapy in, a, in the form of PCG is the only effective adjuvant therapy. This is remember. Number two, salvage therapies like putting the another drugs like. So they, they depend upon the pattern of the recurrence of the uh, tumor after the BCG, especially either you have what you have to you have done the, the, the one third dose, you have done the full dose, what the duration, what you have a schedule, the, the BCG administration, and what the team of uh, tumor recurrence. BCG unresponsive, they must have received at least one induction, six weeks, which as I told you, six cycle and one maintenance, either have the refractive tumor or have recurrence of the grade of tumor. So these are the unresponsive diseases we already discussed. In true BCG unresponsive patients, the only treatment, only treatment is the radical cystectomy. Coming towards the no salvage medical or intravesical treatment have been shown have durable efficacy in a true, true BCG unresponsive patients. So the, remember this thing, the recommendation says about the refractive disease, you have treated the patients not responding, the radical cystectomy would be the last resort for those patients. Another, uh, the article which is published in 2012, uh, by Professor Vijay is that the treatment option available for the BCG failures. Again, European urology, and then we look at the conclusion, the definition, prediction, and treatment of BCG failure remains unclear because still there's no any other salvage treatment available uh, because, because of the unclear or uh, inconsistent studies and heterogeneous entity of the patients and non muslim Radical cystectomy should be, should be the default position upon the failing BCG, but if the bladder preserving is hard, then the several promising, certain other options are available. So this is the uh, intermediate risk as obviously they are, they're considered to be better high risk patients. So whenever you think about this is algorithm I have taken from the European urology guidelines, primary or recurrent tumor without previous chemotherapy, intravesical BCG, which is for one year, six weekly for the induction and three weekly, three, six and 12 months. This is known as one year maintenance or intravesical chemotherapy up to 12 months. So, so these patients, you have to treat with the patients intermediate with the, the intravesical BCG for one year, not for the three years. If there's a recurrent tumor with previous chemotherapy, then again, the BCG. Primary or recurrent tumor with previous chemotherapy, you have treated with the chemotherapy. You can use with the BCG. Again, there's a recurrent tumor. You can use the BCG for one year and late recurrence of the disease considered repeating intravesical chemo. You can use the same thing, which I had discussed about the, the TA disease, low risk. You can consider it as intravesical chemotherapy. If you look at the follow-up, follow-up is between the low risk and the high risk. So the follow-up in case cystoscopy at three months, the strong, if negative, then cystoscopy three to six months and until the till of five years and the year, then yearly, which is a weak evidence. So it is between the high risk and the low risk, uh, the follow-up. So looking for the high risk uh, disease tumors and very high risk, very high risk, as we discussed already, you can directly go for the radical cystectomy. But on the left side, you look at the high risk tumors, Again, same intravesical BCG is starting with the induction, then one to three years, cystoscopy and cytology. Remember, we always ask about the doing the cystoscopy at three months for the first two years and then yearly uh, for the five years and then yearly. So this, there's important thing. You have to do the cystoscopy. You have to do the cytology as well. You ask the patient to uh, the wide uh, urine uh, into the uh, small bottle put over there and do the office cystoscopy in your, uh, your outpatient clinic. So uh, if there's a positive cytology, for example, you have done the cystoscopy, you don't find any tumor, but you find the cytology is positive and no viable tumor, then obviously you have to recheck the upper tract. Sometimes upper tract have the, the tumors, which are cells are shedding out and they're coming into the blood and you find, so you have to evaluate the upper tract and you do the bladder random biopsy, which is strong evidence that you do the bladder biopsy. Sometimes we do go for the prostatic urethral biopsies as well. If you have the photodynamic, you do the photodynamic as well. So this is a very important point whenever you find the positive cytology, but there's a negative cystoscopy. Coming towards the immunotherapy, there's always I ask about the dose, what is the schedule? So we initiated at least after three to four weeks after the resection of the bladder tumor. Starting with the induction, six weeks, then followed by maintenance, three weekly for one to three years. At three months, six months, 12, 18, 24, 13, 36 months. This is the standard one to three years maintenance regime. Remember, dose is 80 milligram, which we have available in Pakistan. So this again, there's a the final results of EURTC, cancer trial, randomized study trial, uh, randomized study of the maintenance. What is the maintenance BCG in the high-risk group, P1 and papillary carcinomas. So they basically uh, made a two groups. One, they have given the one-third dose of the BCG and the full dose of the BCG. And they look for the one-year and the three-year maintenance. What they found, there was a no difference in toxicity between one-third and the full dose. 
toxicity there's no difference between toxicity about the low dose and the full dose uh, while in high risk patients the full dose 3 year reduces the recurrence as compared with the uh, full dose one year but not the progression or the death so remember whenever the patients who have the high risk disease they should always be considered about the 3 year maintenance rather than the one year full dose so um, now i would like to have some discussion about the side effects of the patients who are treated with the bcg so the, the the side effects are the local side effects and the systemic side effects i will start with this uh, the local side effects like cystitis hematuria and uh, the the prostatitis and epididymoarchitis so if the patient who have the symptoms of cystitis like uh, they have the dysuria and like this so we start with the anti inflammatories we start with the phenazopyridine they usually they are local anesthetics so we start with this and if the symptoms improves we don't do anything if the symptom worsen then we postpone the installation we send the urine cultures we start the empirical antibiotics but if the patient who have still symptoms persist then we we send the urine cultures if the urine culture are positive we treat according to the sensitivity if the cultures are negative we will start with the quinolones and sometimes we can use the att as well the patient who have the hematuria we send the urine cultures for exclude the hemorrhagic cystitis if symptoms present we do the cystoscopy might be the patients have the recurrent disease so the patients who have the symptomatic granulomatous prostatitis we send the urine culture again we start the quinolones if they are effective okay otherwise we start the att like aspirin rifampicin then epididymoarchitis again we start with the nsaids send the urine cultures we stop the intravesical treatment but the, if the archidectomy they turn to be abscess we go for the archidectomy at the end coming towards the the patients who have the the generalized uh, side effects like systemic side effects like the generalized malaise fever or thalgia persistent high grade fever which is more than 38.5 which is lasting more than 48 hours bcg sepsis allergic reactions fever usually subside within the 48 hours but the patients who have the persistent fever then we do the further work up so looking for the arthralgia we start with the the again with the nsaids if there's a response very good if no we start with the corticosteroids quinolones and sometimes we have to start with the att as well the fever which is at all which persistent more than 38.5 more than 48 hours we discontinue the bcg installation we immediately send the cultures do the chest x ray we do the prompt treatment like we start the two antimicrobial microbial agents and if at the last we we take the advice from infectious disease coming shows the bcg sepsis usually it occurs if you start the bcg before at the two weeks post you are so we stop the bcg we start with the high dose of quinolones isoniazid rifampicin ethambutol for at least for 6 months we can start with the corticosteroids initially and empirically non specific antibiotic to cover the gram negative bacteria coming short the allergic reaction we start with the anti inflammatory anti histamines we starts we can start with the high dose quinolones sometimes we can use the att so uh, coming towards the carcinoma in situ it is also again divided into the primary secondary and the concurrent primary which is an isolated cis without any associated papillary tumor secondary like cis which is detected during the follow of the patient who have the previous tumor but was not cis concurrent disease like a cis is present associated with other urothelial tumors so treatment of the carcinoma in situ is not only you just go for do endoscopic evaluation and you do just fulguration and this is not like this bcg is, bcg is the main treatment for the patients who have the carcinoma in situ so the proper diagnosis is very important and you have to do the bcg installation or sometimes we go for the radical cystectomy so in the retrospective evaluation of the patients one of the large studies and they found that the patients who have the complete response rate in 48% was achieved with intravesical chemotherapy but they have treated with the bcg there is a 72 to 93% so the the complete response with the patient who have the cis so cis bcg is the main treatment remember one thing so this is the again this is the journal of urology paper published by they have give the 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 intravesical bcg which reduces the risk of progression of the disease in a patient who have this way. this is one of the meta analysis which published a randomized control trial what they say about that intravesical bcg significantly reduces the risk of progression of the tur in a patient who have superficial bladder cancers especially the patient who have the carcinoma in situ so the carcinoma in situ bcg is the main treatment option the, again there is a 17 year follow up of the patient the prospective randomized control trial for the cis that the look that the bcg monotherapy versus alternate therapy like mitomycin and the bcg combination what they found they made a two groups only one group they have given the bcg monotherapy other group they have the combination treatment what they found that they compared the long term efficacy with the patient who have the cis at the last the bcg monotherapy including the monthly maintenance 
was effective and better than the alternative therapy. So this is one of the 17 year large follow-up that shows about the BCG for the CIS patients. The treatment of CIS in the prostate uterus, obviously it's one of the confusing, again, they usually, uh, the many people, they ask about the patient who have the CIS in the prostate urethra. So this is, again, this is a high-risk extravesical involvement. Like this is the extensive disease. It can involve the upper urethral tract. It can involve the prostatic urethra. So the Salson et al. found that 63% of the patients with the CIS, they developed the extravesical disease in the follow-up. So it's a very large number, more than 50% patients, they usually develop the extravesical disease. So if the patient who have the CIS, either it's involving the epithelial lining, which is a mucosal lining, or involving the prostatic ducts. So this is the two things when you, you find that the CIS in the prostatic urethra. So tumor invasion in the prostatic is trauma. They always considered to be the T4A disease and the radical cystectomy is the last option for those patients. So whenever there's an epithelial lining involvement of the prostatic urethra, intravesical BCG is the treatment. But if you do the TUR of the prostatic urethra, it can improve the BCG response because the mucosa will expose with the BCG. When the prostate duct involvement, the data is not sufficient to provide the clear treatment, but at the last, we recommend the patient have the radical cystectomy. So these are very important as a level, evidence three. So, so thank you very much. And uh, these are the centers which I have been trained, uh, starting from the Indus Hospital, Pakistan. And also I have been trained in the urology and nephrology center Mansur in 2016. And at the last at the Nijmegen, Netherland, Netherlands, the Redmond Hospital. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, you may ask. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abdul Hafiz, for such an informative uh, talk. And let me remind you once again that uh, feedback forms are mandatory to fill out in order to get a uh, easy, oh, easy, email, easy email. certificate. And uh, the one more thing that we are going to take question and answer in the end of the sessions. And still, we have three more talks to go. So let's move to the next talk. And that would be given by the Dr. Mazhar Ali Mimin from the Indus Hospital, Muzaffargarh. And his topic is choice of urinary diversion after radical cystectomy. Thank you. So, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. My name is Dr. Mazhar Ali Mehman, and I am a consultant urologist. I am working in Indus Hospital and the Health Network, one of the branch in Muzaffargarh, uh, known as the Safe Tape of the Gan Hospital. So, today I am going to talk about the choices of urinary diversion after radical cystectomy. Although this topic is wide, but I, I will try to cover it max, uh, as maximum as I can. To start with the brief history. Actually, history starts from the 150 years ago. Uh, the first uh, urinary diversion was performed by the Simon, 1852, and he performed proctostomy uh, uh, on a patient with extrophy. And gradually, uh, everyone has worked on the urinary diversion as Simith has performed the Ureto Sigmoy lost me, and uh, Jesuni has created the first rectal bladder. And the most famous one or popular one is the ileal loop, which was actually first described by the Zaire. And uh, in practical, it is established by the Baker. And actually, the, the continent pouches or the new bladder got famous after 1980. The Indiana pouch was made in 1985. After that, the cock has performed the first complete detubularized bowel segment. And in 1988, the most famous one is the allele neobladder, that is the Hotman pouch. And nowadays, the Studers uh, is, is famous all over the world, which is performed in 1989. So before going into the detail of the urinary diversion, uh, we have to start with the, with the patient selection. And the patient selection is utmost important uh, to perform any urinary diversion because we are using ileum and the colon in, these, uh, in diversion. So the previous abdominal surgery related to the uh, ileum or any pelvic surgery or the irradiation our systematic uh, disease should be excluded before the uh, any unit diversion. And uh, liver disorder and the renal disease 
is most important because as we know that the later on the hyperammonemia and the metabolic acidosis can develop in these divergent. And the, the history related to the neurological disorder or the psychiatric illness, which is sometimes required in uh, orthotropic bladder. And uh, definitely the life expectancy is very important for the patient. So our aim uh, in urinary diversion is to cut the leal segment and the reconstruct and the replace it. The, we actually uh, detubularize the gut because we want to convert the high pressure contraction into the lower pressure level. And the second aim is to storage of the urine without maximum absorption. We need a large radius and the geometric capacity and low pressure for any kind of the pouch or the orthotropic bladder. So the methods and category of urinary diversion, uh, urinary diversion is divided into the uh, divided according to the segment that is the intestine intestine is used like ileum colon and the second is the continent or the incontinent and the continent urinary diversion can be categorized into two categories number one the bladder the new bladder which is attached to the urethra or the pouch or the bladder which is present in the abdomen and connected to the outside the abdomen with the continent mechanism. So these are the, uh, uh, this is the permanent urine diversion slide in which we can see orthotropic and the heterotropic bladder. Orthotropic means the normal or the usual anatomical position, that is the normal one. And the heterotropic means the, the, the normal anatomical position is not there, like maybe the continent or the non-continent cutaneous. And suppose ileal conduit is one of the part of the non-continent cutaneous diversion, or the cutaneous diversion may be inside the abdomen with the sigmoid or the rectum. So the first we, I'm going to discuss something about the continent cutaneous diversion. There are, there are many continent cutaneous diversion has been made, but few are the uh, famous, like cock pouch, which is made of ileum, and the double D pouch, mains pouch, pain pouch, and the Indiana pouch. The gastric pouches are almost obsolete because of it's, uh, it is more complicated. The complication is more. It is only used uh, in those patients where the entire lower bowel has been irradiated. So uh, here in this slide, we can see the few examples of the heterotopic cutaneous diversion. Uh, that is the urotosigmarsomy can be done with the rectum or the rectosigmoid, uh, the ileum that is the double T or the man's one, colon maybe indiana or the pen's pouch. And all uh, these pouches are connected with the abdomen with swell mechanism to have a CIC by the patient. So the anastomosis technique, which is actually used for the ureter to the ileum or the anti-reflux valves for the continent cutaneous divergent. For the small bowel anastomosis, uh, ureter with the ileum, the baker and the valus is one of the two are the uh, famous. And uh, after that, one can use the split nipple technique and the lead yoke technique, which are anti-reflux. And uh, for the cutaneous continent diversion, one can use the mechanism of intersusceptible ileocecal valve or the ileal valve or the nipple valve. So the non-cutaneous, non-continent cutaneous diversion, the most famous and nowadays uh, worldwide used is the ileal conduit, which is actually established by the Baker in 1950. For ileal conduit, uh, we have to keep something in mind uh, before going into the, in, for the major surgery. Uh, we have to apply a bag, bag to the patient and uh, the back should be applied in the lying, sitting, and standing position. And the most common site for the stoma is through the rectus uh, abdominis muscle sheath to avoid the later development of a parastomal hernia. The ideal location is free of crease, fold, previous incision, and in the location visible to the patient to ensure ability to care for the stoma. Because once the patient will be discharged from the hospital, he or she needs to 
take care about the stoma. So uh, in last and most important is the orthotopic diversion. Orthotopic diversion, there are some prerequisites for, the, for this diversion. Number one, the urethral tumor, uh, uh, urethral tumor, the urethra should be free of uh, tumor. Number two, uh, during the TURBT, if we are suspecting uh, any tumor, aggressive tumor in the prostate, we have to take the biopsy from that area, or we are planning to go for the orthotopic diversion, we must take biopsies from the prostate. Female, during the surgery, one should uh, send the urethral frozen section, and the orthotopic is bladder is indicated till to the nodal involvement one, not for the N2 and N3. So uh, for the patient selection, we have to assess that, that the patient is manually skillful in manipulating their diversion because these patient needs to empty bladder by, by them. And contraindication to more complex form of the urine diversion is the patient is neuro, has a neurological or psychological illness, or the patient has a limited life expectancy, liver and the renal function is uh, ranged, or the patient has a uh, transitional cell carcinoma of urethral margin. So there are different type of procedures for the orthotopic neobladder. Uh, suppose chemi type one and two, it's a U-shaped. The modified chemi two is a Z-shaped. So there are different shapes. Most, most are the U-shaped or the W-shaped. Here we can see the neobladder can be made from the ileum, that is the studers, hemicoc, cami2, or the serous line, extra mucosal ileal neobladder, hot man. And the, from the colon and the ileocolic region is the man's three at the leak back pouch. So there are different pouches and every uh, neobladder, there are different neobladders and every neobladder has its own advantages and disadvantages. But nowadays, the studers ileal bladder are the serous lined extra mucosal tunnel is uh, are the famous one. Here in this slide we can see uh, we can uh, see the studer's ileal bladder, which is uh, made up of ileum. It is a, the segment is used about sixty to uh, sixty five centimeter. Here the serous lined extra mucosal tunnel. The advantage of this uh, technique is to avoid the reflux to the kidneys. And this procedure was defined by the Abul Nain and he's from Egypt. So uh, orthodopic neobladder reconstruction uh, has every procedure has advantages and disadvantages. Suppose orthotopic bladder, the, the physical image is very good, no stoma is required, but there's a problem related to the orthotopic neobladder is risk of the nocturnal incontinence, and the, the patient needs bladder training. And for the continent unit diversion, uh, the patient has uh, no need for the stoma bag, is a potential for normal to near normal unit incontinence, but disadvantage are the complication associated with the intermittent catheterization of the parastomal hernia. For the ileal conduit, technically it is simpler one, fewer complication, no need for the bladder training, are the no nocturnal incontinence. But definitely it's the stoma, so we need a care for the stoma, uh, and the, the patient may be may have a stenosis or the parastomal hernia. And the most problem uh, regarding the ileal conduit is the this is incontinent uh, diversion. So he needs a bag. So we have uh, some literature review on the uh, regarding the diversion. And this is a unit diversion of a cystectomy. He has used the different techniques. Uh, the technique the, he has used, uh, that is the urethral uh, cutinostomy and uh, little conduit diversion. And he has compared that little conduit is better than the urethral cutinostomy because the, in little conduit, there are less chances of the stenosis. In orthotopic diversion, it uh, it's provides a good functional result, but the but at the cost of more late complication as compared to that of the ileal conduit. And the complications are more uh, related to the absorption, that is the acidotic one. And uh, no evidence that age, ASA score or the positive lymph nodes 
extra cycle tumor growth or the previous radiotherapy were contraindicated for any kind of the diversion. And uh, a study was uh, study done, and they have compared the new bladder and the allele conduit, and uh, there was actually no significant difference in the cancer survival rate. But although uh, the urethral recurrence in new bladder was more, about 1.5 to 7 percent. And a retrospective study was done in about more than 1,300 patients, and they have concluded that uh, they did not significantly saw any difference of the allele conduit or the new bladder related to the GFR. And uh, a an study was done for the four orthotopic bladder, and they have concluded that Hotman and the Studer pouch behaved similarly at anterior systematically and, uh, and clinically. And the continence was good in majority of the patients. So final words are that in recent guidelines, uh, EAU guidelines 2020, it is clearly mentioned that it is not possible to recommend a particular type of urinary diversion. However, most institu institutions prefer allele orthotopic neobulator and allele conduit. So actually it needs training in which setup you are working and what kind of the patient you are receiving. If the disease is not aggressive and picked up early, one can think about the orthotopic bladder. And uh, if the disease is advanced and uh, not uh, in the orthotopic division, orthotopic bladder is contraindicated, one can proceed for the allele conduits. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mazar, for uh, such a nice talk. And once again, let me remind you that we uh, feedback forms are mandatory to fill out in order to get a uh, CME certificate. And we are going to take question and answer if you may have from our speakers in the end. Right. So you what you need to do, just put your question in the question answer tab, which is being shown uh, almost at the bottom of your uh screen right so let's move to our next talk and which is being which will be uh given by professor hamad Atar. he's a big name in the field of urooncology. oncology he's working as a professor uh urologist in the aga khan university hospital and he's going to talk about managing locally advanced bladder cancer thank you Uh, thank you very much for a uh, very kind invitation to talk about uh, this difficult subject of locally advanced and metastatic urethelial cancer. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Ahmad Atar. I'm professor of urology and head of urology at Aga Khan University, and this is where I work. Well, locally advanced and metastatic uh, bladder cancer is a difficult clinical condition. Uh, typically defined as a tumor which is uh, T3A plus. So tumors which are invading locally into the adjoining structures or invading the pelvic side walls is uh, <clears throat> called locally advanced disease. Uh, this may be with or without uh, nodal metastases. An old paper published in about uh, over 18 years back in New England Journal of Medicine from various leading cancer center in which patient was stratified randomly between chemotherapy alone, uh, cystectomy alone versus uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy using MVAC in those days um, <clears throat> compared to cystectomy. And uh, the author showed uh, that combination treatment with cystectomy and chemotherapy provided much better results than cystectomy alone. And when they looked at uh, substratified data in which this Kaplan-Meier curve shows that uh, patients who have uh, achieved a T naught status compared to residual disease, the outcome varies significantly. So potentially if cystectomy can result in a T naught disease, the overall outcome of these patients would be much better. <clears throat> so by definition, an advanced or unresectable disease includes T4B disease, 
with significant nodal involvement, which is uh, N2 plus. And this is considered as a stage four disease on AGCC system. I'll start off with a case, a 23 year old male who was operated for a bladder stone about three years back in a peripheral hospital, presented with low tract symptoms and a palpable hypogastric mass. Imaging uh, indicated uh, significant calcification or a stone in the bladder with thick wall bladder. His uh, creatinine was raised with obstructive uropathy. Uh, and uh, scan at that time, uh, which was uh, PDG, uh, FDG PET scan uh, done because uh, his creatinine wouldn't allow any contrast studies show a locally advanced disease, which is definitely T4B uh, without uh, clear evidence of nodal involvement. His TURBT indicated as squamous cell carcinoma, and um, he was deemed unresectable <clears throat> because of the local extension of the disease uh, with uh, some obstruction of his uh, external iliacs as well on the left side. Initial uh, stabilization was done using uh, nephrostomy tube placement bilaterally. His kidney functions improved relatively, however, he still remained somewhere between two and 2.5 uh, creatinine with a GFR of less than 25. So uh, there was some evidence of FDG evit areas in the preaortic area, but they were not considered uh, metastatic. So essentially he had a locally advanced uh, <clears throat> disease on the imaging which was available. But because of the local extent of disease, he was considered as inoperable and he was referred to us. Um, the patient was adequately counseled about the outcomes. However, because of his significant lower symptoms, lower tract symptoms, um, a cystectomy was done. And his histopathology showed a keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, which was moderately differentiated about 10 centimeters, uh, and it was infiltrative. Um, some of his margins were negative. However, he has uh, significant positive margins. So, I mean, uh, this is another case, and uh, this is a gentleman that uh, have been under my care for the past eight years, <clears throat> he initially presented in 2013, 64 year old smoker, diabetic. Uh, his CT and TUR indicated a high grade papillary urothelial cancer. The CT indicated no extension of disease. So uh, after a re TUR uh, and reconfirmation of the fact that he has a non muscle invasive bladder cancer, which is high grade, he was offered BCG induction, which included six cycles plus uh, maintenance uh, and uh, six, uh, three, six, 12, 15, 18, 24. Uh, <clears throat> and he was quite regular with his follow-up <clears throat> and his dexistoscopies, barring the initial one, have always been negative. He was lost to follow-up during the COVID uh, peak and presented uh, to the cardiologist with uh, some the cardiac issues at that time, his angiography was done and the angiography showed that he has uh, obstructed coronaries and he had a PCI performed, following which he developed hematuria and uh, the further evaluation of hematuria resulted in identification of a left lateral wall and posterior wall uh, mass. He underwent uh, a cystoscopy at, <clears throat> after this and we found that uh, there is a significant uh, multiple lesions on the left lateral and posterior wall close to his uh, left ureteric orifice. However, the tumor was completely uh, resected uh, using an AMAS R block technique. The uh, significant uh, uh, neoangiogenesis neo around the tumor. However, the overall configuration of the tumor looked quite uh, papillary type and non-muscle invasive. His histopathology 
however, indicated uh, a muscle invasive bladder cancer, which is high grade, and you can see that uh, there is a tumor infiltration close to the detrusive muscle. Uh, he had uh, a raised creatinine, uh, which was 2.5 with an obstructed uh, left kidney. Uh, PET scan was done and the PET scan indicated uh, significant extension of the disease, which is DNT3B with a hotspot related to his, uh, uh, to his common iliac on the left side. So um, he was, uh, um, stage is T3B, clinically T3B with N2 disease. And um, we discuss options of management, uh, including a radical cystectomy. He agreed to the radical cystectomy. His um, final pathology came out to be T2B. The nodal status was none of the 16 lymph nodes were positive including that common iliac lymph node, which showed KZS necrosis, and all his uh, margins were negative. So he had actually a BCG-related granuloma in his, uh, in his lymph node. So the question is, uh, what should be done next about this patient? Should he have a regular imaging because of the negative uh, margins and negative nodal status? At three months, should an immediate systemic therapy be done as he has failed BCG and is a high risk of metastases? Should local radiation be considered or chemoradiation or should he be considered for immunoradiation therapy, immunotherapy? Now, if you look at the uh, options of management from the guidelines, we see that uh, patients who are unfit for platinum-based chemotherapy and he is unfit for platinum-based chemotherapy. Uh, there is some role of uh, using immunotherapy with uh, pembrolizumab and ethizolizumab. Again, depending upon the FGFR3 and uh, PDL1 status. However, uh, the evidence is, is, is not very strong. The immunotherapy is. Uh, is, a, is something which has come up more recently. There are good quality trials. We know that uh, patients who have uh, cancer develop mutation and these mutation make them immune to the uh, local immune system, uh, which generally recognizes uh, abnormal cells or foreign cells and attack them with the, the T cells. Uh, these T cells remain inactive and do not attack the normal cells um, because of the receptors. However, uh, some of the cancer cells can start expressing these receptors and the, and the T cells would not be attacking those cancer cells. In order to block those PDL uh, receptors, PDL uh, checkpoint inhibitors are introduced and they can essentially make them amenable to the T cell attack. So this in theory looks quite good uh, and there is initial response as well. However, uh, it is associated with significant side effects and uh, the data is still not mature to indicate in, in regular clinical practice. Patient's frailty is, a, is another important factor in patients who have um, locally advanced or metastatic disease. And these can be assessed in various uh, scales and indices. Uh, this is the one, the G8 screening tool is, is what is recommended by the guideline panel. There's another gentleman, uh, a, a young person relatively who presented with uh, gross painless hematuria. Uh, Histopathology indicated a sarcomet white tumor, uh, and he has locally advanced disease. Um, this is histopathology, and this is a rare kind of uh, a tumor, which is a pure uh, um, sarcomet white cancer, which is really a biphasic malignant neoplasm. 
which has uh, the evidence both of epithelial and meso mesenchymal differentiation. As you can see, that there is an epithelial and a mesenchymal component. These are extremely aggressive tumors, and uh, there is uh, very little evidence about the use of uh, adjuvant therapy in these patients. So variant pathology is something that you do see in, in these individuals, and it's important that one should be mindful of uh, various variant histologies like micropapillary squamous and sarcomatoid, uh, which, which are all very aggressive cancers, something that we reported few years back and clearly indicating that uh, patients with variant histology have worse prognosis even uh, compared to uh, squamous cell and uh, adenocarcinomas. Well, what else can be done? Uh, well, there's an option of uh, using adjuvant uh, radiotherapy in, in these patients uh, because chemotherapy generally doesn't work in that situation. So uh, these are some of the papers which have indicated role of adjuvant radiation therapy in patients who've got variant histology after radical cystectomy. I've recently seen this general practitioner, 69 years old uh, male who have practiced for over 40 years, uh, presented to the cardiologist uh, with ischemic heart disease. He's got a poor ejection fraction underwent URP for obstruction and found out to have a bladder cancer. And this was an invasive, poorly differentiated cancer, which is PSA negative and GATA3 positive. So this is a poorly differentiated urothelial carcinoma. Uh, and this tumor was extending from the bladder, from the prostate into bladder or bladder into prostate. Uh, the resectionist at that time thought it's moving from prostate into the bladder. However, it's PSA negative and GATA3 positive. So this is essentially a poorly differentiated retinocarcinoma, a uh, poorly differentiated urothelial cancer. T4A disease, 69-year-old uh, uh, with uh, many comorbidities, poor heart. And uh, this is one of those patients who would require real counseling in order to make sure that they undergo uh, treatment without any significant morbidity. He is under consideration at the moment for radical cystectomy after optimization of his cardiac condition. So options is chemoradiation an option, chemotherapy followed by uh, cystectomy or upfront cystectomy followed by adjuvant therapy or upfront cystectomy with imaging. And all these are relatively valid options. However, uh, what patient decides um, and the treatment has to be tailored accordingly. Uh, the other condition is, is particularly uh, in metastatic setup. Uh, the first question that you need to answer according to our guideline is whether the patient is platinum eligible or platinum ineligible. So platinum eligible patients who have got a good GFR of greater than 50, probably would be going through uh, the ideal treatment, which is cisplatin-based. However, platinum ineligible patients with a lower GFR of uh, 30, they should be considered for carboplatin, uh, and then also those who have poor performance status. For patients who are platinum ineligible, uh, the PDL uh, status should be assessed and they should be considered in, uh, for either uh, immunotherapy or uh, best supportive care, depending upon their overall clinical condition. So in order to summarize uh, this talk, I would say that uh, locally advanced bladder cancer is a condition, is a difficult condition to treat. They are often associated with uh, variant histology. Uh, they are often associated with obstructive uropathy. Um, and clinical staging is marred by poor, uh, by inaccuracy in, uh, in order, because uh, the use of uh, CT uh, with contrast is difficult in patients with obstructive uropathy. MR is, is not as good, and often PET scan is unable to really define uh, the correct local staging. So the management strategy should be individually tailored um, and in my opinion, most patients are operable in the right hand. So if, if you have a center where there's significant experience in dealing with these patients, 
these patients can be operated quite safely, uh, particularly um, uh, if there is an issue with prolonged anesthesia and related effect, they should be considered for uh, cutaneous ureterostomy, which is a fairly good and straightforward option for urinary diversion. And that really takes uh, one and a half hour less uh, to operate on these patients. But it's important to remember that these patients would not be amenable to just cystectomy and either use of neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy would be really important. Uh, and in certain situation, chemoradiation therapy uh, would be ideal, particularly if you have uh, uh, variant histology. So um, I start. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hamad, for such a nice presentation and sharing your clinical experiences and the real life scenarios of the patient with the bladder cancer with us. And it was a, such an informative session for uh, all of the audience as well. So now it's uh, let me remind you once again that uh, feedback forms are necessary to fill out in order to get a CME certificate. And we are going to take your question answer in the end of the session. So kindly just put your session uh, at the question answer tab, which is being shown at the bottom of your screen. So we are moving towards the final uh, talk of this scientific seminar today, which is the nodal dissection during radical cystectomy. Does number and extent matter? And this talk will be presented by Dr. Imran Khan Jalbani. He's working as a consultant urologist in the Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi. <laughs> Hello, I'm visible to all. Yes, Dr. Imran, you are visible and kindly uh, share your screen, please, so we can see your presentation as you are coming live. Yeah, I'm trying to share the screen, but I'm unable. Uh, Dr. Imran, your screen has been shared. You please switch to the PowerPoint, please. Yeah, we can see you or we can see your presentation as well. Thank you. Dr. Imran, there is some problem with your in, uh, internet, I think. So I think you just switch off your audio. Oh, so, sorry, you just switch off your video so we can uh, listen to you and see your presentation. I think there's some problem with your internet connection. Yeah. I think we should move to the first slide. Hello. Can you guys listen me? Yeah. Yes, yes, Dr. Imran, please continue. Okay, so so I'll be touching on that thing. Uh, uh, these things, there are different templates used in the literature, and uh, I'll be touching on all those uh, templates and their real impact on the survival. Whether there is a real difference in the survival of uh, bladder cancer patients after extended versus super extended versus standard lymphadenectomy. Uh, the survival or not all level three evidence and uh, this is statement uh, there's a strong recommendation that perform lymphadenectomy as integral part of uh, radical cystectomy but there's no mention of a number or even uh, a very low level of uh, evidence for extended lymph node dissection 
Why we perform lymph node dissection? Obviously, because of the uh, uh, fact that it's essential part of lymph node uh, radical cystectomy. Good 20 to 30 percent patients may harbor the tumor in lymph node uh, lymph nodes. And the Uh, hello, excuse me, Dr. Imran, can you hear me? Dr. Imran, can you hear me? Because your internet is so interrupted and we can't actually hear you exactly. We can't hear you, we can't see your screen properly. Hear me, please.
just one second yes dr imran we uh, we can hear you now and you just start your presentation can you see my screen yeah just one second yeah we can see your screen as well okay so so i was saying that uh, the eu guidelines does not have any strong evidence for anything like extent of the lymphodissection or, or even a uh, number of nodes to be removed are not mentioned so i'll be while lymph node is essential the dissection is essential part of cystectomy is because of fact that good 20 to 30 percent of lymph nodes uh, are are positive at the at a, a cystectomy specimen so there's no consensus on extended number that we are uh, discussed in this presentation so if you look at the drainage of bladder there are various nodes at least 12 different groups are identified and most of them uh, lie into the true pelvis and uh, uh, we can appreciate from from this slide there, there are different templates which are mentioned in the literature uh, however, EAU guidelines mention only three, that is standard, extended, and super extended. And we know the boundaries of these all lymph node dissections. Uh, if we go for extended, we need to get uh, up to aortic bifurcation, I mean common iliac bifurcation, and this includes pre-sexual nodes and deep obturator naps. Uh, Depopulated nodes on the right side of this image are mentioned as a 10 and 12. So these are to be removed in the extended lymph node dissection. If you go for a super extended lymph node dissection, then uh, this dissection has to be extended with inferior mesenteric artery. So do we have really uh, any central lymph node uh, group for the bladder? Uh, this was answered by a student's unit. Uh, a robust paper which was published in 2019. What they did, they injected technetium 99 uh, into different sites of the bladder and, and they got a single photon emission tomography. And we can appreciate that these black hysterics on the screen are mentioned as the site of injection. And you see there's a significant crossover of lymphatic from one side to other side. Hence, it was proved that there's no single lymph node, uh, sentinel uh, lymph node, which is draining the bladder. However, they came up with the interesting finding that is 50% of nodes draining the bladder lie outside the true pelvis. And if you extend your dissection, up to common iliac uh, aortic bifurcation, you tend to remove 90% of blood draining lymph nodes. So coming up to lymph, standard lymph node uh, dissection versus extended, uh, this is an, this was paper from uh, Dr. Gunem's um, uh, center and a center from uh, Germany as well. So interesting finding that 290 patients had a cystectomy and mean nodes which were removed were 43 and around 28% of patients had a nodal positivity as well. And if you see that most common nodes which were involved were right obturative followed by paracaval nodes. Uh, but it's worth seeing that this picture on the right side that the level 3 lymph nodes only had a specific or a skip lesion in 6.6%. It means that uh, two pelvis lymph nodes were, were negative, but only paracaval paraiotic nodes were positive. The possible explanation for this was that most likely in
would improve the survival. Now coming to the number of nodes to be re removed, uh, how many? The various literature uh, and there is no consensus on number. However, uh, uh, Skinner's unit did publish a series of 20,000 patients and, and they reported that at least 20, 14 lymph nodes, at least 14 lymph nodes are to be excised. However, Harry Hart's unit published a series of 322 patients. In patients who were pathologically node negative, they recommended at least eight nodes to be removed. But if there's a node positive, then the lymph node number should be increased to nine. And there's hardly any difference between eight and nine. The story doesn't end there. In 2019, this interesting paper came from um, a British, uh, it was published in British Journal of Urology. And 731 patients underwent radical cystectomy. And they came with a conclusion that if you need to remove positive lymph nodes, then the 45 lymph nodes should be removed to get a 90% probability of getting out positive lymph nodes. If the number number decreases to 25, then probability decreases to 75%. So they concluded while saying that at least 25 lymph nodes should be removed uh, removed during cystectomy in order to get uh, uh, get uh, uh, long-term outcome. Again, this paper was published in Cancer 2006. Over 1,000 patients underwent cystectomy between 1990 and 2004. Mean number of nodes were nine, which were removed, and the range was zero to 53. The conclusion of this uh, paper came that extended lymph node dissection does not improve, improve the outcome or even survival. So, while looking at, is there any real benefit of a survival in extending the lymph node dissection? So, various papers have been published and there's a mixed uh, conclusion from them. Some of them has shown some uh, uh, cancer-specific survival benefit, overall survival benefit, but others have not shown. And some of authors like Eskiel, uh, a couple, uh, Hassan Abul Yameen's paper did mention about one thing that removing the 15 nodes may improve the survival as well. So this is, a, a, uh, this was published in 2019, a first ever randomized control trial. And this was intended to, to see a 15% improved, uh, improved survival in, in, in extended lymph node uh, dissection group versus standard lymph node. So almost 400 patients, 200 uh, patients in each group. Around 25% had a node disease. Median number of nodes were removed, 19 in limited and 31 in extended group. And this is this is a real ex explanation that if you extend your nodal dissection to extended level, then you tend to remove more lymph nodes. And it was interesting to see that there was a, uh, around 10% difference between the survival, uh, five-year recurrence-free survival, cancer-specific survival, overall survival, and median overall survival was 52 months in the limited group versus 70 months. Even though this was really significant in terms of number of 10%, but however, these results could not achieve a 15% improvement in the survival. Hence, uh, hence this uh, RCT concluded that there is no survival benefit of aesthetical significance in these two groups. Does extended lymph node dissection, uh, dissection um, um, increases the complication Answer is hardly any. Uh, this increases only lymphatic drainage. Uh, I mean, a lymph uh, lymphocyte chances in extended group. Uh, so, if we go down, what is the take home for extended versus super extended? Uh, even though the published literature does not support extended uh, lymph 
road dissection for every patient. However, there there have been a few few articles which have shown some benefit. Others have don't uh, shown any benefit. So Muller did not show any benefit. However, if you tend to see the more aggressive tumors in terms of a T staging, then one can do a super extended lymph node dissection with the hope that positive nodes or positive nodes would be removed. Like we should do extended um, or super extended node dissection. One can uh, decide on the basis of a uh, patient to patient. Like all the patients who had a T3 disease or a gross nodal positive uh, disease, then one can extend lymph node uh, dissection to super extended level. However, these uh, these these effects are not coming from any randomized trial. So if we summarize it, the standard lymph node dissections can improve, can remove only 50% uh, of nodes in the true pelvis. Extended lymph node dissection can remove almost 90% of lymph nodes draining the bladder. This provides a better staging. Contemporary literature does say that there is an improvement in uh, recurrence free survival, cancer-specific survival, and overall survival. However, this was not shown in currently published uh, single RCT, which is available. If you extend lymph node dissection, uh, you may increase the operative time by one after, uh, and there's a cost to it as well. So, if you look at the different guidelines, like EAU, EAU and NCCN guidelines, they all recommended extended lymph node dissections. However, there is no number of nodes which is mentioned. And remember that these all have a low level of recommendations. Probably this coming article, coming uh, randomized trial, which is to be uh, published by 22 August and and their end point is three-year uh, cancer-specific survival and overall survival. Uh, this might give an answer whether one should extend uh, lymph node dissection to to extended level. But however, the, to summarize this, the extended lymph node dissection is 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 recommended. Minimum of 15 nodes uh, are to be removed. Uh, removed. Uh, uh, and overall survival and cancer-specific survivals are better in contemporary literature. However, RCT did not show that. I'm extremely thankful again, and that's all from my side. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Imran. Thank you so much for your nice and wonderful presentation. And you just, uh, you just has gone through all the details uh, about the lymph node dissection and extent and the, uh, how much the numbers are important and what is their significance in terms of patient survival benefit and overall survival uh, so it's i think it's an untouched topic and you just uh, went through it amazingly thank you so much for uh, your time and your cooperation thank you so much dr imran so uh, this is the end of our scientific session we have done all our four talks and uh, we have uh, one or two questions first question is from the doctor Mazhar, and he's asking about the feedback forms. So Dr. Mazhar, you have joined us like uh, uh, from the speaker link. If you go through the uh, as a participant link, then you will uh, get the feedback form there, uh, which is being shown uh, almost at the bottom of your screen. And uh, a second question is from Dr. Sayyid Adil Ahmed, and he's asking a question from Dr. Professor Hamad Atar. And uh, his question is, that in patients with a tumor in the diverticulum, in the bladder diverticulum, what is the criteria? Either we should go for the partial cystectomy or the radical cystectomy. So I would like Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Professor Hamad Atar to answer this question, please. Dr. Hamad, can you hear us, please? Dr. Hamad, are you there? 
I think there's some problem with the yeah I think there's some internet issue or I would like to ask Dr. Abdul Hafiz if he can answer this question please Yes, can yes. you hear me? Dr. Hafiz, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank can you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Please continue. Yeah, uh, uh, basically the uh, the TCC bladder, either it's in the diverticulum or whatever the location is, uh, they always uh, considered to be, if it's a muscle invasive disease or it's a recurrent uh, BCG failure disease, they always considered, considered to be a radical cystectomy rather than doing the partial cystectomy. And uh, so... You can't do the only the, the resection of the one portion of the bladder and leaving the whole the mucosa, which is uh, always potential risk for the recurrence of the disease. So the radical cystectomy is the better option for those patients. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Doctor Hafiz, for your for giving us your idea and your opinion about this. And we have no other question uh, so far, so I think we should conclude our session. And uh, with that. A scientific session comes to an end. I hope all of you enjoyed listening to it as our speakers did delivering it. It was truly an honor to have such an accomplished individuals who have done uh, who ha who have done as much in the field of urology. Thank you for being so engaging and interactive throughout. I hope there will be many more seminars on urooncology, which is the need of today actually. And once again, I am thankful to all the participants and uh, all the speakers, starting from Dr. Abdul Hafiz, Dr. Mazarli Mehman, Professor Hamad Attar, and in last but not least, Dr. Uh, Imran Khan Jalbani. And uh, Alhamdulillah, it went very good. And we uh, hope to see you next time again. Till then, uh, enjoy your Sunday, enjoy your day. Thank you. Allah Hafiz. <laughs>